Hello, and welcome back to the Outdoor Minimalist Podcast. I'm your host, Meg Carney, and I'm an outdoor and environmental writer and author of the book, Outdoor Minimalist, Waste Less Hiking, Camping, and Backpacking. The Outdoor Minimalist Podcast has a goal to give listeners actionable ways to waste less hiking, camping, backpacking, and more during every step of their process. Your impact outdoors starts long before you hit the trail and goes beyond leave no trace ethics. You'll learn how to identify sustainable outdoor brands, how to ask hard questions regarding sustainability, and begin to shift and evolve your mindset to integrate minimalism into all of your outdoor pursuits. In episode 65 of the Outdoor Minimalist podcast, we are talking about biodiversity, biodiversity loss, and what you can do to improve the biodiversity in your very own backyard. Now, you may have noticed if you listened to last week's episode that I decided to stay on theme with a little more ecology and biology based content since that episode featured Robin Lee Carlson and she discussed the environmental impact of wildfires. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, it was a really interesting conversation and she shed a lot of really interesting light on different areas of wildfires, including how they can benefit landscapes and how our own cultural and historical interpretations of fire have changed over time. Anyway, I'm excited to continue the theme and share a little bit more science-based content on the show. And to help guide this conversation and help share his expertise, I was joined by Dylan Jones. Dylan is a biologist and science communicator interested in uncovering the secrets of biodiversity. His science communication efforts go in-depth about wildlife conservation, they break down evolutionary theory, and highlight the incredible array of life on our planet. You can find him on Instagram under the name Dylan the Biologist. Supercharge your dog's mealtime with Neobytes Functional Dog Food Toppers. Neobytes unlocks the unique power of cricket protein to promote firm poops, a thick and shiny coat, and everyday vitality for your pup. With a powder format, these toppers can easily be mixed into existing foods to make mealtime more exciting. Cricket, a hypoallergenic and humane protein, is not only a better option for your pup, but it's better for the planet too. Producing virtually no greenhouse gases and using fractions of the resources used by traditional proteins. Check out Neobytes products on Amazon and at eatneobytes.com. Use the discount code CRICKET15 for 15% off your next order. And then use the code OUTDOORMINIMALIST for 10% off every order after that. Thank you for joining me on the show today, Dylan. I have really been working to add a little bit more, I guess, biology and ecology related content to the show. So I'm excited for your specific insights on these topics. But before we jump right into that, can you first tell me a little bit about how you got involved in outdoor recreation and just generally how it fits into your daily life? Yeah, for sure. I always love talking about my early experiences with nature because I think it's a little bit different than a lot of people who kind of got into this field or into a biology or outdoor field. I used to be deathly scared of basically all things nature to the extreme, I think. It was to the point where I I wouldn't go gardening with my grandfather because I was terrified of worms. And I, I don't know, I just... I freaked myself out. I watched way too many scary movies about the outdoors and too much early 90s Animal Planet, the most extreme top 10 deadliest stuff. And it just polluted my mind for years until I grew up a little bit and became a teenager. I think around 15 or 16, just something switched. And I replaced a lot of that fear with uh, fascination for the great outdoors. And that's when I started getting more and more into the biological sciences, learning more about nature, learning more about reptiles and amphibians, which I specialize on nowadays. But within that, we were always doing outdoor recreation. We were going to lakes, me and my family. We'd have little lake trips where I'd be terrified to go in the water. I'd stay on the boat, but we would always go to the lake. I would always go fishing with my grandfather. Of course, he had to put the worm on the hook because I was scared of the worms. Um, But it was something where I was sort of inoculated with outdoorsy, naturey things, even though I was terrified of them from a very young age. 
huge. Wow, yeah, that is really interesting. I hear a lot about those types of phobias and things like that, but usually not from people on the show. So that is interesting to hear you say that about your childhood. And is there like a specific experience or instance when that switch happened or you think it was kind of gradual? No, I think it, there was definitely a little bit of gradually getting more and more used to it. To kind of make matters worse, my family owned a, uh, a pet store. So I grew up around a lot of animals and I, I was always very, very content with watching them from like behind the glass. You know, I love going to the zoo. I, I love doing all that. But um, it was whenever they were beyond the glass and in reality where they could actually interact with me, that fear would kick in. But um, I, I just remember spending a long, long time staring at various animals, usually the snakes, sometimes fish, but usually it was the snakes or the lizards or the frogs or any of the other creepy crawlies and just kind of being able to observe them in a controlled environment. It really helped me out when I was maybe 10, 11, 12. And then, yeah, when I was 15 or so, we were, I don't remember where, but someone had one of those large constrictor snakes, probably a Burmese python, and asked if I wanted to hold it. And for some reason, I just said yes. Like something just overrode that fear. I think I was 15 or 16 when that happened. And then just kind of hit the ground running ever since then and got really, really into the outdoors and really, really into nature. But um, I guess I'm a little bit of a late bloomer, especially for my field. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Maybe kind of like exposure therapy type thing unconsciously was happening. So that's interesting. And you had a lot of exposure to these outdoor spaces and animals, and that obviously had an impact on you. So did that kind of bleed into what you chose as your career path? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from the start of undergrad, I immediately just went into, uh, I want to work with animals in some capacity. So the biological sciences was the path for me. Like that's the one that made the most sense. And it's changed in how I'm pursuing that. I used to want to work at a zoo. And then I was like, ah, maybe that's not for me. Then I really got involved in research and then just went very deep into academic research, doing a lot of field ecology, just going out and studying organisms. And now I'm sort of nearing the end, very close to the end of my master's degree and kind of reassessing exactly how I want to do research. But yeah, it's it's fun. Yeah. And biology is kind of a really broad field. So what type of work exactly do you currently do or are you working on in your master's program? Yeah. So it does vary quite a bit. I can say my background was very, very much so field ecology, which I think is what people think of when they think of a biologist. It's going out into nature and studying some organisms or some system out in outdoors. And a few of them include like we did a lot of tracking of turtles in mountain streams. So just trying to figure out their movement patterns. We've done surveys using like a royal we because I've worked with so many other amazing people on all these projects. But um, yeah, surveying for species at a urban nature sanctuary in Houston, just trying to assess what reptiles and amphibians are found there. But my current research is really theoretical. I really got into this evolutionary biology track because I saw these really cool stories of evolution. So just when we look out at nature, we can look at a tree, we can look at an organism, we can look at a system. And behind that is millions of years of evolutionary history, which is a story that is just waiting to be told. So my current stuff is looking at basically trying to answer the question of why are there so many species of reptiles and amphibian in Central America and Mexico? Oh, wow. That seems really specific, but also really broad at the same time. (laughs) And I'm not exactly sure how to phrase this next question, but I'm kind of wondering how does biodiversity fit into that realm of your evolutionary exploration? Yeah, I guess at the end of the day, the way we could describe it is that I study biodiversity. If we just take a very simple definition of biodiversity being the diversity of species found in an area, both plant, animal, fungi, whatever you want, realistically, biodiversity is just a lot of those species. You're studying quite a few of them if we take a very surface level look at that. So with my research, I'm looking at around 16 to 1700 species throughout my whole study area. For this project, it's really a big data project. So I'm pulling in information from many sources like Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which just has occurrence records. So where are species found? 
that's like one of my biggest data sets that I'm using. And it's been really cool to actually work with this multi-species study at this scale. Yeah, that project sounds really intense and <laughs> big. Yeah. <laughs> Is that global biodiversity website that you mentioned like available to the public? Because if it is, I'll link to it in the show notes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just GBIF.org. It's a 100% free open access data. It's a really cool resource. Basically, they pull occurrence information from places like citizen science applications like eBird or iNaturalist or any of those places where you could just upload a picture from your phone. But they also pull it from museum records, other scientific surveys, as well as just a huge array of different sources. So it's really cool. You get a cool snapshot of biodiversity on Earth. Wow. Yeah, that is cool. I'll have to check it out later, but I'll for sure link to it. Thank you for sharing that resource. Yeah. So you kind of gave a definition of biodiversity already, which is if people haven't already caught on what we're talking about. So can you explain a little bit about why biodiversity is so essential and important in the world? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's always the question. It's fun because I know a lot of people get into it and there's this intrinsic value of biodiversity. We like to go to an area and see that there are a lot of species there. It's often why people try to go to tropical jungles because there's lots and lots of biodiversity there. So there is that intrinsic value, which does trickle down into economics, especially ecotourism. So there's real dollars to be made, real money that is directly tied into biodiversity. But there's also this other angle of it. It's called options. Phylogenetic options is a more broad term. And essentially what it's saying is that throughout the sum of the biodiversity, there is a wide array of different traits, of different elements, of just different things within the species that might be useful for humans down the road. If you look at most medicine, it has often been derived from a plant found in nature, and that is still being done to this day. Anyone who has worked with an herbal healer or a more traditional based healer knows that plants are medicine. So if we have more diversity of plants, we have more diversity of medicine. So those are kind of the two that I really like to focus on a lot because, you know, money is a big one. Medicine is a big one. But also, I mean, the, for, for me, the biggest thing is that it's just cool to have really cool species all over this planet. And it's just cool to point to things and say, you know, this is a bristlecone pine that is thousands of years old and it is butted up next to another species of plant that only lives for maybe six months at a time or maybe a year. I just think that's super, super cool. But of course, that does doesn't really get you the grant money to actually study the biodiversity. <laughs> right. Yeah, I really like those two examples that you gave because they are more human focused and that tends to be what people gauge their value from, you know. But if we're looking at biodiversity from just nature's standpoint, there's obviously benefits. So can you talk a little bit about what those would be for the ecosystem that it's happening in? Right, absolutely. So if we look at it from that ecosystem level for you say you go to a national park or you go to some beautiful nature area, every single species that is found there plays some role in that ecosystem. If you remove one, especially really important species that we call keystone species, that whole ecosystem can actually collapse. It's called a trophic cascade if things are just breaking down. So by having this biodiversity, you can fulfill more roles. For example, say we have a bunch of pine trees in a savanna. Well, those pine trees actually end up serving as homes for many species of birds, like woodpeckers. Then those woodpeckers may interact with other species. And what you have is a beautiful web of interactions. So when we have that biodiversity in an area, you can actually have a fully functioning ecosystem. And if there is a role that hasn't been found yet in that ecosystem that isn't being utilized in some way, often there is a species that we just don't know about or it's a species that we don't see, something really small, like an insect or even little microbes or something. So yeah, it's really just about all the different connections and the different purposes that everything kind of serves in an ecosystem. So it makes a lot of sense why biodiversity loss would be bad on mm -hmm. several levels. <laughs> right. But I know that it is a phenomenon that's happening all around the world, and it has been for quite some time. So I do want to talk a little bit about the loss of biodiversity and why exactly it's happening. Yeah, I mean, biodiversity loss is, oh, 
it's such a broad topic and there are so many different reasons. So if we look at it on a, on a global scale, there are things like increased urbanization, just humans moving in, mowing down a forest or a grassland or anything like that to build up new houses. And inevitably, you lose critical habitat for species. We, I think we often forget that species have a limited range. They only exist in certain areas, not widespread throughout the world. So if you remove a series of forests or a series of grasslands, which are the two I always like to focus on because they're my favorite, you lose the biodiversity that is found there. There's also, of course, things like climate change, which is just fundamentally changing ecosystems. But when you really get down into more granular, like if you look at a very particular area, the reason the biodiversity loss can be incredibly varied. I live in San Diego, California, and we have an incredible array of parks. We're actually in one of the most biodiverse regions in the world. But if you go to most of our city parks, you find almost entirely invasive species. It's entire hillscapes dominated by a Chilean sea fig, for example. And so invasive species, which some would argue is still considered urbanization because they hitchhike with humans in the most part, can absolutely just destroy the biodiversity of a particular area. But I've also worked in other areas where there is no really invasive species. You really don't see them as often. And for there, the biodiversity loss is still often human caused. You know, roads being pushed through, uh, climate change can still make a big, big impact on species. But yeah, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that the reasons are incredibly varied. You could point at 20 or 30 different things, which ultimately kind of circles back to humans, unfortunately. <laughs> always. It always circles back to humans, right? Yeah. <laughs> Is there, I guess, an example of maybe an area near you on like a more local level of where biodiversity loss would be more apparent? You already gave one example, which was the invasive species. But if someone was just going for like a walk in the park or something like that, where there'd be things that they would be able to notice that they'd be like, okay, this might be not as biodiverse as it should be. Yeah. And I think like the best example is almost every single city park. If you go to a park and you see that it's just pure manicured lawns with perfect green grass or even just dirt and then you have a, maybe a few little stands and then sidewalks just spanning throughout it. That's a great example of biodiversity loss. And I think a great example of biodiversity loss where did it need to be lost? You can still have a city park with species that are found in this area and you don't have to destroy it. But I think it's a lot of the times we just accept it. We've already become conditioned to seeing a park as a place with manicured grass. I'm not against the grass. Like, you know, it's much easier to play a game of soccer or, um, go out and run around in manicured grass instead of trying to jump over cacti and succulents and big rocks and whatnot. But even just something as minor as that is manicuring an area it results in biodiversity loss. Lately, I've been on the beaches quite a bit. And every time there's a big storm, big things of seaweed and debris and, and other uh, things wash up on the beach, and it's called a uh, sea racks. And those often also get manicured. They also get removed from the beaches so that we have this pristine, white, perfect beach. But that's an example of biodiversity loss. By removing that, we're actually removing a lot of the insects that feed upon that, which in turn, the birds that are feeding on the insects don't have as big of a food source. And then it also even changes the entire geography of the beach because, well, you don't have dunes anymore because those sea racks actually catch sand and over time form massive sea dunes where other grasses, other plants can actually grow on top of it. So oftentimes, whenever we go out into nature, especially if we're living in a more urban area, we see that we have a very, very manicured experience of nature. We only see it as it needs to be very clean in a way and very sterilized. And that is directly contributing to biodiversity loss, even on a very small scale. Right. Yeah. Everything is really just kind of like clean and made so it's easy for humans to move through. So I did really like the example you gave of the beach because I don't spend a lot of time on beaches and I don't really like think about it that often, but that makes a lot of sense that it would change it a lot. And are most parks, would you say, being managed in that manner or are there other parks that are managed? managing biodiversity in other ways? Yeah, it really depends a lot. And, you know, going back to the whole, like, different parks have different uses, so they have different management styles. Like, San Diego actually has some of the best city nature parks that I've seen in a very large city. 
I mean, there's a trail five minutes from my house that is almost perfect because of our canyons. It's very, very hard to keep canyons manicured. So in there, there's lots of plants. There's lots of just dirt trails. And those are managed in a very, very hands-off approach, which I think works really, really well. I just show up to a parking lot or park on the street and walk in and I'm already in nature. But I grew up in Texas and various areas around Houston, Dallas-Fort Worth. And you would see very, very stark contrasts in how the nature is actually managed in the parks. I mentioned that I did a project in Houston and one of these wildlife sanctuaries. It's Edith L. Moore. It's actually the headquarters of Houston Audubon. And it is absolutely incredible. Just a tiny little park that is kept very natural. They don't want to do too much to it. And it looks incredible. But then if you walk, I think there was another park maybe 10, 15 minutes up the road that, again, completely managed, clear cut, mowed often, making sure nothing is next to the sidewalk on the trails. And I think it's really unfortunate because actually the more natural parks are the ones that are much more enjoyable to walk on. You actually have things like shade uh, when you're walking, which in that in that Texas heat was uh, really needed. So do you think it's about like the parks specifically? And you said they all kind of have different purposes and that's kind of how they're basing this management. So city parks, I mean, that's kind of up to the municipality and everything, but then state parks and national parks, do they have kind of a different approach? Oh, yeah. Yeah, when you get up into uh, higher levels like state and national, it gets incredibly varied incredibly quickly. So if we just look at different designations, like in the U.S., we have things like national parks and national forests and national grasslands. National parks, I've always said they're kind of like amusement parks for nature. That's really their purpose. They do often protect natural resources. They do often protect cultural resources as well. They are an incredible spot for protecting, and they have lots of rules and regulations. You often have to pay an entrance fee to get in. But there are areas of these parks that are acceptable losses. We know that if you have 10, 20,000 visitors walking over a trail, it's It's not going to stay perfectly pristine. It's never going to look great. The nature around that will be degraded over time just by nature of 10,000, 20,000 people making very small footsteps all en masse. And so that's one management style. But if you look at things like national forests or national grasslands, they are more focused on sustainable use of their resources, resources being lumber or grazing land for surrounding the cattle farmers. So they put forth, of course, we could still recreate on them. I go camping in national forests all the time and I love there's some national grasslands that I have extremely fond memories of in like Colorado and New Mexico. But their primary focus is for, say, a lumberist. Oh my gosh, a, a wood chopper. <laughs> I'm forgetting the ner- the term. A logger, maybe? There okay. we go, a logger. <laughs> yeah, just a very basic term. I was like, ah, oh, I'm forgetting this one. But yeah, their, their whole way of managing that land is so that you plant a tree and then some years down the line, loggers can come in and extract those resources, those trees, so that we can use them in our homes, we can use them for fuel, we can use them in various industries. And so that's a different management style that is still protecting natural resources because some trees may take five years, some take 10, 20, 30, et cetera, et cetera. While those trees are growing, that is habitat for species. That is areas where you could have a large degree of species that live there. And it's more sustainable in a very, very long term point of view, because as many trees as they're logging, they're often also planting and replacing them. There's always issues with management styles. There's always things that could be done better. But it's really incredible to see just how different parks are managed completely. There's so many crazy classifications out there for them. Yeah. And like you said before, it seems like it is always circling back to how the human humans interact with the land. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) So uh, we're looking a lot at the human impacts of this, obviously, and you touched on a lot of really great points, mostly on like larger scales. And so how do individuals, I guess, impact biodiversity loss or even biodiversity? How do you say biodiversity like goodness? (laughs) 
Oh, oh, yeah. Um, Good biodiversity. I don't know. Biodiversity gains, I guess, yes, would be the, yeah. the exact biodiversity opposite. Biodiversity gains. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, gains, management, sustainability, conservation, all of them work. And talking about like the individual impacts, it's always a tough one. It's always so tough because on one hand, we can make an impact. You know, I was actually camping out at a state park just a few weeks ago and some dude went out and started doing donuts in a vegetation restoration area. And we had to call the ranger and get that all involved. So that is one person making a very, very direct impact, right? Just by actively destroying a vegetation area. But I always say that in the grand scheme of things, Our impacts do pale in comparison to what the top, the people at the top, usually governments, corporations, et cetera, et cetera, can really do. But where we have the greatest benefit as individuals is that we can make a very large impact locally. Globally, our impacts are relatively minor, but there are usually stream cleans going on around almost everyone. They're not really well advertised. You really do got to search for them a lot of times. But there are ways for you to get directly involved in actually cleaning up an area and actually pulling out buckets and buckets and, I mean, so much trash in just an afternoon. There are many, many parks that have some type of, usually it's like Friends of the Park name. Like, I I know Friends of Lick Creek, which is a park back in College Station where I did my undergrad that I worked with. There's, I know here we have like Friends of Rose Canyon. I want to say there's a Friends of Ticalote Canyon. But those are all volunteer run. They almost always accept everyone. And they do things like restoration. They actually go out and plant plants. They go out and do cleanings. They do trail maintenance. So there are ways for us to make a really, really big impact locally and an impact that you can often see almost immediately. And of course, you know, if you have the luxury of a backyard, there are little things you can do to actually make it more of a a habitat for species, almost a, a safe haven so that we're not contributing more to that biodiversity loss. Yeah. What would be some examples of how to contribute to the biodiversity in a positive way if you do have a yard? Or even, I guess, community gardens would count, but people mostly plant food there. So, But gardening, you can also contribute a lot to biodiversity. Oh, yeah. And I think it'll actually make a lot of people happy to know that the answer is often just do a little less. I understand that in this culture we have of manicured front lawns and maybe you have an HOA that tells you how to manage the property you own. But in our backyards, it's often a place where we can do kind of what we want. So if you have trees out there and the leaves are falling around the fall and winter time, you can just leave them leave them on the ground. They end up creating great fertilizer for the plants that are back there. If you are able to, you can replace your grass with native grasses. My girlfriend is a botanist and she's been chucking native seeds throughout our entire backyard for a while now. And the best part is it still looks like a grass lawn, but we don't have to water it now near as much. There are ways to actually create little habitat Uh, I think pollinator gardens is one of the names that you make. And they're actually really cute. They're basically like little boxes shoved with little tubes and basically little places for insects and pollinators to get into. And I've always loved those. They attract the lizards and then the lizards are in my backyard and I like to watch them. And I I just like that. So now I'm like, oh, cool. Our backyard kind of has a little bit of habitat for some really cool native species. So I think I've seen maybe four or five species in my backyard, which I can't do everything I want to do too, because landlord, but yeah, it's just really creating habitat in very small ways. I always say that a box that is, you know, if if you take a cube that is three foot by three foot by three foot and make that abstracted cube into a really, really great habitat for say lizards or pollinating species or birds, something along those lines. To us, that's minor. That's such a small physical space, but to that animal, that's a mansion. That's huge. So really just, yeah, hang up some birdhouses, make a little pollinator garden, you know, let your leaves decompose and go back into the earth and give it nutrients. Yeah, and I suppose it is helpful to learn a little bit about the native species in your area and what will really help them. So this is hard to do because not everyone lives in the same place, obviously. (laughs) Um, So what would, I guess, be some resources you would point people to if they wanted to learn more about that in their specific area that they live? Yeah, if you are lucky enough to live near a native plant nursery, those are awesome. The people there know so much. They are just fantastic resources. Often there are outdoor societies, like always 
like being parts of uh, herpetological societies, basically just a bunch of people who like reptiles and amphibians hanging out. Those often are filled with people that you can just ask good questions to. But because we live in this increasingly globalized and digitalized world, you have really good resources right in your pocket. Your phone, I always use this app called iNaturalist which I kind of mentioned earlier with, I think, GBIF. Basically, you could take a picture on your phone and iNaturalist has an AI-driven software that will tell you or at least give a pretty good guess as to what the species is that you're taking a picture of. And I found that it's actually incredibly accurate. So what I've been doing is going out onto a trail and just taking pictures of every plant that I see because I'm not the best with my native plants yet. And it will tell me what the species is. It'll give me some information about it. And if I happen to take a picture of something that is not native, it'll, it'll actually tell me that, hey, this is an invasive species. It's originally found in Asia, for example, but now it's also here in Southern California. And so just by doing that kind of every day, just going out and taking a picture of some new plant that I know nothing about. You learn just piece by piece by piece, and it gives you a, a bigger framework. There's also, you know, if you really want to kickstart that, there are bio blitzes in many, many cities where it's just uh, for a weekend or whatever, people go out and take as many pictures of biodiversity as they can. And that's a pretty fun way to get directly involved into learning more about your native ecosystems. Yeah, that sounds really fun and kind of a good way to build community if you are just kind of getting into this area of learning. But I'll be sure to link to the iNaturalist app. It sounds really cool. So if people are just kind of getting into learning about the natural plants and animals, and they maybe are also pretty new to outdoor recreation in general, do you have any advice on ways to, I guess, immerse yourself more in nature on a really localized level so it doesn't seem so daunting? Yeah, yeah, because th this is something I actually really had to figure out on my own. Kind of going back to the whole, I, I was deathly scared of things and now I'm not. I didn't really figure out the outdoors until I was probably 18, 19, 20. That's when I kind of had to figure it all out. I had never been really tent camping before that, so I had to learn that. I hadn't really gone fishing except for with my grandfather where he did most of the work. So it was something where I had to really teach myself. And what I found worked the best for me, other than finding friends who already do it and asking if they can teach you how to camp, I guarantee you everyone who goes outdoors wants to teach other people how to go outdoors. And if they don't, then eh, I don't know, find better friends, I guess. But what I, what I started doing was just, I would just look up a, on my map. I would just open up like Google Maps, look for a piece of green somewhere on that map and just go there. Just drive out there. Don't worry too much. Just make sure you have good shoes and water. Just the absolute basics. And just explore. Just walk around there for a little bit. That's how I had to get started. And that's actually still my favorite way to find new areas. Whenever I'm in a new area for a little bit of time, I just zoom out, look for green on the map and go there. I, I don't look it up ahead of time. I don't figure it out. And that has been by far the best way. I think there's a lot of anxiety that comes with people who are just getting into the outdoors, just getting into nature, because there is this idea that you need to know everything. You need to know how to save yourself if you know an avalanche comes down, even though you're in Southern California where it's 70 degrees in the wintertime. I just think that we, we often overthink things a lot, especially when it comes to nature. And the best thing to do is just get out there, make a mistake. It happens. Just be safe. Just don't do anything stupid. Don't push your limits, but just try it. And then over time, you'll just start to find your group of people that make nature more fun. You'll find probably some buddies that'll take you camping and teach you the ropes of how to, well, put up a tent or how to find a good sleeping bag for really cheap. Or you'll find uh, that you maybe really like going cycling on the trails uh, or going trail hiking or trail running. There are so many different ways to actually explore the outdoors and explore nature and, and find something that fulfills you. But all of it just starts with just doing it, just going out there and trying. If you do want to go hiking with someone, honestly, just put out an open call. I've seen hiking, like beginners hiking groups, things on like eventbrite.com or meetup or, um, oh gosh, even Reddit. I've seen a lot of people do hiking clubs. A lot of cities do have hiking clubs. That's a really awesome one. And some of them are very, very niche. I know I fundraised for this one group. I think it's Hike Club out of, I want to say they're out of LA, but they're just a hiking club dedicated to intersectional identities, I think was like their big focus. Not remembering everything perfectly, but, but it's like they're 
essentially very niche groups. So there's even ones for, of course, beginners, absolute beginners. There's ones for seniors, 55 plus or whatever. So there's ways to get involved at a very, very low barrier of entry. Yeah, those online groups. And I guess that is one really positive aspect of general online communication is it's really easy to connect with people with shared interests. So sometimes it just takes a little bit of effort up front and then soon enough you find your community and the activity that you love. So I love that. And how can listeners learn more about you and your work? Yeah, the best place to connect with me is just honestly on Instagram. It's just Dylan the biologist. Very simple because I'm Dylan and I'm a biologist. But you can also find out a little bit more about my background or some of the other things that I do through my website, which is learnadventurously.com. We mainly just do like blog posts, travel, and some like courses that will help you if you want to get into the biological sciences. Awesome. And I'll be sure to link to your socials and your website and all the resources that you mentioned in the episode notes. So if people want to check that out later, they can go ahead and do that. But with that, thank you so much, Dylan. It was very informative and I'm so happy you had the time to come onto the show. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you hear, let me know. Leave a review and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can still find me on Instagram at outdoor.minimalist.book for daily updates, other educational resources, and to help build an outdoor community with a shared goal to create a better outdoor space as we recreate.